Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are jumping in to world history, the world before the flood, which is kind of mind-boggling to think about this entire break in human history as well as scientific history insofar as we have scientific history. Um, so, but we do know that there were two different communities developing. How do we know that, Greg? <laughs> well, it started with good old fashioned family values. One brother <laughs> killing another. <laughs> uh, denominational differences. Um, you're going to worship your way, I'm going to worship mine, um, so I must kill you now. We're talking about Cain and Abel, fountainhead of two different worldviews, two different religions, two different philosophies, two different ways of trying to approach God. When God had banished Adam and Eve from the garden, he had shown them how to do animal sacrifice. He'd instituted this sacrament, and they, of course, had taught their boys when they came along. And it, apparently, this is a time where they're there, and there's no mention of Adam or Eve being present, but they're both bringing their sacrifices. Notice the bringing part. That is, to a place, to where God is. And from what little we know of that ancient world and what the text has told us, God was in the garden. It was his sanctuary, his temple, its home, a place where heaven touched earth. That's where the tree of life was. And that's where there were cherubim, these incredible, glorious, weird-looking, angelic creatures that guard his throne, in this case, guarded the way to paradise. And there was this flaming sword associated mm -hmm. with them somehow. We can also associate every other place that God was said to be in the Old Testament with the garden having been patterned after it, right? The tabernacle and the temple, mm -hmm. they they mm -hmm. look like the garden directionally and ornamentally and such. You know, God keeps, God, like any good author, Chekhov's gun, let's <laughs> set things up initially and then keep referring back to them, but in such a way that when the real thing happens, you're still caught off guard. So we will touch on those, the tabernacle, the temple in, in, time. But in theory, this time we're doing history and not biblical theology. So, Right. But I'm if sure someone was wondering another... why we think God was at the yeah. garden and they would bring their sacrifices to the gate. Well, this, this, there's a couple simple reasons. One, God talks. And the last mm -hmm. place God talked to anybody was in the garden. Two, God shows his favor. And uh, this is a similar argument to yours. Throughout the rest of the Bible, when God showed his favor to a sacrifice, he did it by setting it on fire, mm -hmm. usually from heaven or from the from the temple itself. There was one handy-dandy source of fire right there at the garden gate, and it would be very easy for that flaming sword to swoop down and ignite a sacrifice and either ignore or totally destroy the other one. So this is what we've got, Abel brings sheep. He's a shepherd. And we're told he brings the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof, three Fs, firstling, flock, fat. This is not something he thought up. No one, no one in his right mind would think, I want to bring God a very, very special gift, something that he, his heart longs after, something that will make me look really good. I know I'll bring him a dead animal because, you know, <laughs> everyone wants a dead. I want a dead animal. You want a dead animal. Everybody wants a dead animal. No, this is something that he'd been told to do. Can I play devil's advocate there for a minute? Uh -huh. Well, the, the flock is in the ancient world wealth, right? Sure. So he's he's bringing something that costs him greatly oh, to bring yes. um, and killing it with no intention of eating it himself, apparently, which <laughs> is, I think, uh, some would say, essential to the idea of sacrifice, that it's not going to do you any good once you give it up. It's the idea of it's giving giving you any good that you're giving up. So, Yeah, that's kind of a mystical or, um, there's another word probably that goes better than that, of, of sacrifice. 
that we get better by giving up stuff. That's really not how the Bible ever presents sacrifice. Sacrifice means you kill something mm -hmm. and you kill it substitutionarily. You kill it as a substitute for yourself. You know, we're, we're big on, oh, giving sacrificially means giving till it hurts or these Christian school teachers, you're making such a sacrifice. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> to do what God calls you to do is not a sacrifice, except in the true sense that we are living sacrifices to God in Christ in all that we do because we're united to him and his sacrifice. So I, I can see how people would argue that way. And the point that it cost him something is to the point. David later on, when, when buying the Temple Mount and the uh, animals and implements to offer sacrifice, I will not give unto God that which costs me nothing. So, so far, so good. And Cain, we're going to see, brings veggies and fruits and things. And there's nothing wrong with that as a first fruits offering, as a grain offering. But that has to follow a blood offering because it is by blood that we make atonement. And that's the ongoing message here. Cain was, was willing to sacrifice in the modern sense, to give up lots and lots because he had lots and lots and it was all great. And God should be really pleased with how much he was willing to give up. And God was not impressed because God had specified the proper way of worship. So here at the beginning of the human story, we have a fundamental conflict. Why, why are we spending time with this? Because this is the beginning of the human story. This is the beginning of history. We, as we trace history, we're going to see this competition between two different ways of relating to God. One is to say, I have got nothing, but I will do what God tells me to do, not because it, it merits anything with him, not because it, it does anything for God or helps God, because, but because it represents a message, a promise he's making me. It is an act of faith to claim a promise that originates in him, not in me, because I got nothing. The other is, well, if there is a God, I'm sure he'll be very impressed with what I've got. And um, you know, I will, uh, by my great, wonderful goodness, uh, satisfy God, whatever gods there be, and um, life will be good on that basis. My good works are a sufficient foundation for... A utopian society. And when we find out that doesn't work, the second set of people look at the first set of people and say, well, you're the problem. You keep it disrupting things by this, this licentious libertarian talk about free grace and forgiveness and the love of God. You, you, you will tolerate any kind of, of perversity and wickedness because you can always forgive it. Sorry, we must kill you now. And so whether we're talking about Baal worship or the slightly more refined worship of the of the pagan Greeks, the classical society Greeks and Romans, or Islam, or Roman Catholicism at its worst, we keep we're gonna keep running into this. There are going to be those who cling to the promise of God and those who want to help it out or wholly replace it. Because once you start helping it out, you have replaced it. Mm -hmm. The promise is 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 seamless. It is all grace. And the moment we dilute it with something good we've done, then it's not the promise anymore. It begins here. And yes, it begins with murder. You could almost think of it as ritual murder. We're told that, that Cain and Abel talked in the fields. We're not told what they said, but we are told <coughs> in, um, I think it's in Luke's gospel, our Lord says, seemingly in passing, that Abel mm -hmm. was a prophet. Mm -hmm. From well, the Abel to Zechariah. Yeah. <clears throat> we don't know any other thing he ever said. The only time he's ever said to say anything is when he's talking to his brother. I think the conclusion is what he told him was the gospel. It was the message of, look, this is what God requires. You know this. I'll help you. I love you. It, I don't know why you didn't do it the way you're supposed to, but hey, you want a lamb, I'll give you a lamb, or you can buy it, or I'll buy all your veggies, you know, but you have to come on God's terms and that whatever he said, as a prophet, as a, as a lawyer of God's covenant, so infuriated Cain that he killed him and buried him. And then when God comes and asks about it, or actually, we're not told that God, here's what it said. It simply says, the Lord said unto Cain. Well, the only place that God has been talking has been at the garden gate. It seems very likely, and at first it seems, no, this would never happen, but this is the way people are. Once you've committed a horrible crime, 
Most people you would think would run as far from God as you can. And sometimes that is the solution, but sometimes people run as close to God as you can get and hide in church. It looks like Cain went back to the garden gate, just kind of kicked around, like hmm, not doing anything, just being holy and near God and all that. And God says, He might uh, even have been doubling down. Yeah. Saying, I am going to come on my own terms. Yeah. Yeah. And so God reproved, questions him, reproves him. The first sin in the world had been with respect to the sacramental tree. The second was with regard to the sacrament of sacrifice, followed up quickly by murder uh, on religious grounds. And from this, God banishes Cain from his presence. Back when God came looking for Adam and Eve, we had a reference to the presence of the Lord. The thing associated with it was his voice. Here again, God and Cain have been talking, and Cain is banished from the presence of the Lord. And in fact, uh, he even complains about it. He says, um, uh, from thy face shall I be hid. This is so, this is such a stiff penalty. I'll never be able to see you face to face again, Lord. Uh huh. Right. Mm. So he goes out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod in the east of Eden. He, there was a place where God spoke. There was a place to sacrifice, and Cain leaves it. And so, where all this started, we have two communities initially before the flood. One exists close to the garden gate. We don't know how close close would be, but close enough that at least once a week, and maybe more often, they could tread up the mountain and offer sacrifices there. The other, it's some distance removed because they are not going anywhere to the garden gate. Besides, there are monsters on the mountain. Cain's told mm -hmm. us about them. Maybe a few people even crept, crept up a little bit and looked, took, took a peek and saw the monsters in the mountain, the gods, the demons that are there. And so the legends linger. Uh, but more and more, Cain's descendants probably stayed as far away as they could. And they concentrated on pleasure, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. They concentrated on technology. They concentrated on having lots of good food. Um, and they really didn't feel compelled to submit to any of God's laws with respect to this to get what they wanted. Because although they claimed to be good, godly, religious people, they had none of the Spirit's power. They so where are no... you getting some of this? Which part? The, what they were pursuing and the oh, attitude with which they were pursuing it. And so we shift to the next several verses that follow. <laughs> Cain, <clears throat> we're told in verse 12, actually verse 16, I can't read. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch were born Arad, and Arad begat Mechajel, and Mechajel begat Methusiel, and Methusiel begat Lamech. Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adah, the name of the other was Zilhah. Adah bare Jabel. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all as handle the, the harp and organ. And Zilhah, she also bare Tubalcane, an instructor in every artificer of brass and iron. Sister of Tubalcane was Naamah. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilda, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a young man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. We're taken rapidly through seven generations. Cain, at some point in his probably later life, because there would need to be people for this to work, founds a city. God says, you're going to wonder. He says, no, I'm not. I'm going to found this here city. What goes into a city? Well, some ideas about architecture and mathematics and sanitation and carpentry and um, whatever you, masonry, trigonometry. You can just think of what to have even the most rudimentary city as opposed to a hamlet or a bunch of hovels. Some stuff's going on there, some, some degree of knowledge and understanding. The end of seven generations, we run into a, uh, this man named Lamech, who reinvents marriage. Cain had reinvented worship. He reinvents marriage. He has two wives. <coughs> and uh, somewhere along the line, 
whether associated with those wives or not is not particularly clear. Some young man does him bad and he kills him and feels completely justified and threatens to take on anybody else who dares call him on it. So justice has gone out the window. And there are three boys that come out of this. One is named Jabel. He is the father of all who dwell in tents and as such as have cattle. Now, that's interesting because cattle can mean sheep and goats or it can mean bovines. Abel was a shepherd. This is not what it's saying. The thing that's put first is he dwelt in tents. He didn't stay in the city. He was on the move. He did not. He was rootless. He moved from place to place with his cattle. Um, That was new. Uh, His brother Jubal is uh, culturally more productive, perhaps, but economically, not at all so. He is the father of music. He not only knows about singing, he invents musical instruments and leans how to play them and probably invented some way of teaching it, perhaps even musical notation. Now, eventually, as the population of the world grew, this could be profitable. Anybody who tries to make a living in the music industry today knows it's difficult. I have one young man in high school right now. He's a great musician. And his entrepreneur father has basically said, that's nice. Become an engineer. You can do your music on the side. You have to feed your family. And, you know, I can feel, I can feel the tension there. This, this young guy is, he has great promise. The odds of making it as a musician in this world, not great, especially as a soloist. You want to be part of a studio orchestra, maybe. So how is it that uh, Jubal can set himself up to spend all his time creating music? Somebody's paying for this and possibly not willingly. <laughs> and that becomes a little clearer in the next one. We have Tubal Kane, who is an instructor and of every artificer in brass and iron. So we're doing full-blown metallurgy, and when you're talking iron, now you have to be digging into the earth. Now you need miners. Nobody wants to be a miner. Mm-hmm. The Welsh did not want to be miners. <laughs> no. It's a horrible existence. Oh. Mm-hmm. But somebody's insisting on it. As I was saying earlier, um, they felt free to cheat the system. You can acquire slaves. You can kidnap people and make them your slaves. You can go to and war with other groups. By the groups. way, where are all the people coming from? It's not like yeah. there are a lot of other families yeah. out in the earth already. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's seven generations. Initially, it would not be that. Now, by the time we play out seven, eight, ten generations to the flood, the population of the earth is going up exponentially. But at this point, mm-hmm. maybe not so much. Well, it's the early part of the exponential curve, right? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Not that rapid. Yeah. So, there. a question I have been asked, and I I know others have been asked, is, well, if the godly line is all about pursuing dominion in the name of of God and Messiah, why aren't they doing any of this? And a lot of the answer has to do with what what corners you're willing to cut to get there. Uh, godly people do things like go to church on Sundays and not work. Uh, they do not raid neighboring villages and take slaves. Um, they don't steal from other people and take their crops or their um, the metals they've uh, they've mined. There's also a, a groundwork, right, of loving your family and your neighbor. Yeah, that kind of precedes any active exploration and things like that. Your first priorities are much closer to home. In fact, they may be home, worship at home, and then your calling, but your calling is not going to take you away from home any more than you can help it. Now, granted, some callings take you away from home, and that's a point where Christian men have to make some hard decisions. But if you're not a Christian, the decision's not that hard. Well, money, that settles everything, doesn't it? I can, in fact, I can have a wife in two places. Lamech had more than one wife, and it seemed to work okay for him. <laughs> now, that I think this brings us back, maybe, according to whatever list you have in your hand, I don't remember, <laughs> perhaps to the technology of that time. Um, brass and iron. I did a quick look up on brass uh, just before we started. And um, in terms of, of real production of it, 
the the articles I was seeing, most of which, in fact, were put up by bronze making companies, not by any um, museum or historical institute, not even by Wikipedia. It was here are these companies that sell brass. They want you to know where it came from. It makes their sites look more interesting, I guess. <laughs> and the the last one I clicked on said thirty BC. Hmm. Um, that's the Roman Empire. So iron, you know, traditional historians tell us when we passed out of a Bronze Age into an Iron Age, and it was somewhere I think after the the, the Trojan War. I forget the exact dates. I should look. So we're talking very developed civilizations already. Very very developed civilizations. I mean, what we're what we're being dis, we're being told about is that in the, within seven generations from Adam, the the world that then was, had, at least as far as metallurgy was concerned, a technology that approximated that of ancient Rome, in fact, of medieval Rome, in fact, of anything up until the production of steam power and electricity. And at the seventh generation, we still have three more generations to go. These people lived a long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, They could share knowledge. Lives of great scientists could overlap for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. We don't know what all was there, nor has God chosen to tell us beyond these hints here. Um, We know that at the end of this time, Noah and his sons, presumably with some help, built a boat that was half the size of the Queen Mary and that survived a world flood. These are not primitives, ignorant slugs. These are men of considerable intelligence. Um, In passing, when we get to uh, chapter 5, verse 1, we're told in closing, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Adam wrote a book. Writing goes, from our perspective, way back to the beginning of humanity. But in terms of evolution's perspective, Human-like creatures are around a long time and are are living, interacting for a long time as hunters and gatherers even beyond that before anyone invents writing. In fact, arguably, they would put it within the realm of ancient Egypt. And here, we have the first man who ever lived writing a book. Mm-hmm. That's kind of huge. Now, might might make a difference in how you view humanity as yeah you know, <laughs> as an entity when we look at these generations and see this development, it reminds us that the image of God is creative Mm. and also uh, humbles us in the modern time because we love to think of ourselves as the first to do these things, the unprecedented time, the unprecedented inventions. Mm. And it makes us feel like we're special in history. And really what we need to see is that history has seen this before and sees it again. And it also helps to um, decrease our fear because we see wars or we see these things happening and we think, oh no, it's never happened before. It must be the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, But instead we can see that God in his image bearers um, does things many different ways, but we see a lot of beautiful repetition because we're not the only ones that can discover what's out in God's creation. Uh, But one of the other things I was going to add that is back a little bit more to the point of the two peoples or the two seeds um, in um, some of my exploration of what we were going to talk about today in the side of the Hebrew language. uh, I was looking at the two sons whose names almost sound the same in English, but they're actually completely different in Hebrew, Mm -hmm. which is Enoch and Enosh Mm -hmm. or Enos. Um, They're completely different words, which was, I went looking because I was curious. Um, uh, It's actually more in Hebrew is more Mm Hanak for Enoch. And it has the idea of being dedicated or devoted or trained for a purpose. Uh, The words also used for the temple. And so I was thinking of the ways that for Cain, he saw his son and his city as the way he's basically dedicating himself to his own way, to his own work, to establish what he wants. And so there's that sense of grasping after power um, and permanence, but by his own means, whereas the name of uh, Seth's son, Enosh, 
is one of the words that the Bible uses for man, but it's always used when it wants to denote man to denote man's frailty mm. and smallness. And it's very important because then as we go into chapter six and it will speak about man, it uses a different word for man, uh, the word that where we get Adam's name. And so it's I think there's that sense that in Enoch, Cain is trying to press forward and push forward and do everything by his own power, whereas the godly line knows their weakness and um, they understand that they can only do so much and they're not, they are able to stop and rest because they know it's not all about them trying to perfectly uh, accomplish whatever they want to do. And so I think there's that sense between the two groups that we we see their motivations are very different. Um, and then also later when we finally get to the name of Enoch uh, in the godly line, we see him after he has his son begin to walk with the Lord and to name his son, um, basically death will, or judgment will come at his death, Methuselah. Mm -hmm. And so he is a man that the Bible calls a, a prophet. Uh, and so he takes that dedication and training and turns it to the Lord uh, rather than for himself. But there's a lot of um, attempts by that, by Cain's line to do so by their own strength and to think that they really are the only ones that will ever do this. And yet the Lord quickly wipes them out with a flood and we, in a sense, do it all again, uh, always thinking we're you know doing it by our own power. Um, but really, our technology is only by God's grace that we can we can find anything in His world and understand it. That's so interesting that there are those two similar names, Enoch and Enosh, and mm -hmm. Methusael and Methuselah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, did you Lamech happen to look into? Oh yeah, them too. Uh, did you happen to look into the Methuselah as well as Methusael? Or I did not look into Methusael. No, I was more focused on the contrast of the of Adama or Adam and mm -hmm. uh, Enosh, and then I went backwards into Enoch. But mm -hmm. it is very interesting in the Bible because names have a lot more meaning to them than they do to us, and especially when we see men who are called to be prophets, very often their children are connected into the, <laughs> the message that they bring, um, which has that sense of continuity and it's coming in this next generation. Um, it's not Meher just about Shalal us. Hashbaz, the yes. archetypical <laughs> example. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Or those who don't care about the next generation. Um, I was just reading about Hezekiah this morning and I kind of went, really Hezekiah? Because mm -hmm. he gets the message, you know, because of what you've right. done, all this bad stuff is coming. And he says, this is a good word. Mm. I'm going to have peace in my time. <laughs> and then the Lord needs to follow with comfort, comfort ye my people. <laughs> because yeah. it's, not in, it's not in Hezekiah or any of the other men that would try to, to lead. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Seth and that's the other line after Abel is dead. <laughs> Uh, Adam and Eve produce another son. They call his name Seth, which means appointed or put or set in place because he is, according to um, Eve, he is another seed appointed by God instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So she's beginning to realize some things about the seed. She may have expected that her firstborn would be the seed. Mm -hmm. Now she looks back and says, yeah, he's the seed of the serpent. Abel was was godly. Oh, but he's dead. But now I have another. The seed is dead, and yet now here's a new seed who's alive. Hmm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, so God has another way, and maybe he's not the end of it either. And then men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. We're not told a whole lot else about that other community, Eden or Adna or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, because apparently, as the world reckons things, they didn't do much else experience except experience a short time of, of revival, of turning back to God, and perhaps at this point, moving beyond the garden, worshiping God directly from wherever they were. Uh, and that's where Adam's book ends. And we open the next book, and we get a genealogy. I would prefer not to spend a whole lot of time mm -hmm. with this, but I would like to point out a couple real obvious things. If you read it, it sounds not only like a genealogy, it sounds like a chronology. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, that would mean that we can actually pin down more or less the date of the, of the flood and of creation. And there are um, people who profess to believe the Bible who can't handle the idea of a young earth. And so they are quick to explain away the apparent chronological factor and say, no, no, here are other things that could happen because sometimes genealogies have gaps, which is true, but they don't also have years associated when they do. Um, and there's this guy, Canaan, who shows up only once here, but twice later on in another version. Okay, well, that's interesting, but not necessarily problematic. Um, a couple things in um, Jude, Jude speaks of uh, the prophet Enoch being the seventh from Adam, mm -hmm. which if you count it out is always what it is. Well, that's just taking the, liter the, the literary text at face value. I mean, you look at it, it is seven. That doesn't mean that's actually really what happened. Hmm. Jude Something seems to think it was important that it was, otherwise he, <laughs> he wouldn't have mentioned it. Yeah, why mention it if it's not <laughs> significant? Well, it's the whole symbol. Okay, let's talk symbolism. The Apostle Peter, <clears throat> and he only has two epistles. In both of them, he manages to associate the number eight with the flood. Mm -hmm. One of them is straightforward, that on the ark, eight souls were saved. Straightforward, mm -hmm. yes, we can count, there were eight, not a problem. But in the other epistle, he speaks of Noah, the, the King James renders it, Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, blah, blah, blah. But person has been supplied, it's in italics, mm -hmm. literally the eighth preacher of righteousness, um, at least according to my limited knowledge of Greek. And at which point you have to ask, well, how? I mean, where are you getting this eighth thing? It's, it has puzzled uh, theologians so much that uh, at least a couple versions uh, translations of the Bible have replaced <laughs> eighth with some, some have replaced Tenth, it. Yeah. yeah uh, one of eight people, when you have to supply mm -hmm. no end of words for that one. Some have actually changed it to Noah with seven others. The word seven is not there. The word yeah. is eight. The word <clears> that <throat> is in the text that Peter put in the text yeah. was eight. Because <laughs> he wants to talk about the eighthness of the flood mm -hmm. because he's a good biblical theologian. He knows that eight has to do with resurrection. And he wants just to see that this death of the ancient world was a resurrection into a new heavens and a new earth on the other side for Noah and his family. But still the question is, well, how do you get eight? Well, the easiest way really is to draw a bar graph of the ages of the patriarchs as they're given mm -hmm. here and note a couple odd things. Uh, one, Enoch uh, was taken to God's presence directly when he was relatively young, 365. <laughs> and so his father outlived him. Mm -hmm. And um, Methuselah outlived his Methuselah, who's lived longer than any other human being except those that never died, lived longer on this earth, longer than anyone else. Uh, he outlived his son so that when you count, leaving out the two people who a normal transfer of office would have skipped, Noah is the eighth patriarch. He's the, the eighth, eighth preacher patriarch. of rights. Yeah, yeah, he's the eighth preacher of righteousness, mm -hmm. the eighth prophet, which may, it would, that's understandable why Peter would want us to know that, but it only works if the chronology is correct, because mm -hmm. if it's not, then we lose that and we're still left wondering what in the world was Peter trying to get at. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have- I don't want to cut you off too mm -hmm. soon here, but we do have to start uh, wrapping up. So before we, we close- why do you think we spend so much time this this first part of Genesis on a community, a timeline, a time before one of these communities is going to be wiped out? Because we know what's coming, right? The flood. Yeah. So why why is this important? Why is it here? Rachel, what are your thoughts? It seems that it's our first example of what was given in Genesis 3.15 of the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And it is important because it demonstrates in terms of the extent to which violence and wickedness thrives, it demonstrates 
how easily sin would overwhelm us without the grace of God intervening. Um, the only reason we're, all people aren't wiped out is because Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, but that's not because Noah is so great. The Lord shows grace. That That's how grace works. And so it's it shows both man's capability in developing technology, building things, spreading across the whole earth, having tons of people within 10 generations. And yet uh, all of those things, which he's supposed to do from what God commanded, they actually are his destruction because he doesn't do them in faith. And so it's it's an early uh, example for us, a first of what happens when we set these two people on the earth side by side? What will they do? What can they accomplish? But what also, what are the effects of sin? Because coming out of the garden, we don't know. I mean, we know now because we look back, but it shows us sin brings false worship, murder, bigotry, and this general spreading everywhere. Sin is not containable except by the grace of God. And it all deserves the judgment that we see in the flood. We need to see that set up because if you look to the New Testament over and over again, um, I'm thinking of Jude and Second Peter and other places where it says, you think everything is fine. You think you can carry on just like you are and God doesn't see. Uh, he saw in the flood. That's why the flood came. They went on doing all their things thinking they were fine and they weren't. And the Lord loves to give us the past to help us in the present uh, to understand his character and how he treats uh, the wickedness of man, but also how he saves. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic answer, Rachel. I would like to add just a little bit, I think it's is in keeping with what you said. We're seeing the beginning of human history. That only happens once. Mm -hmm. If you want to dip into any other part of history, there's always the problem of, well, I want to concentrate on the Reformation. I want to concentrate on the ancient Greeks. I want to concentrate on the Industrial Revolution. Where are you going to start? <laughs> <laughs> How far back do you go to get a running start at this? You, let's let's pick something that the Romantic movement in, in literature and art and such, which lasted, I don't know, 50 years, give or take. Um, How far back do you have to go to get a running start at explaining that because so many things feed in and how do you yeah, know you need to know the <clears throat> enlightenment you need to know yeah. what the enlightenment came from you need to know all mm -hmm. of the things that it's reacting to yeah it's a lot of our previous episodes where we mm -hmm. every time we try to talk about the beginning we keep getting pulled forward and backwards back. and forward and such yeah and 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 so here at the beginning of human history there's nothing back of this except the decree of god uh, there's nothing more that we have to go back. We cannot, we don't look back and say, but what were the social and economic forces that forced men to conceive of this thing called marriage? <laughs> um, none, because God instituted it on day six and that's where it started. Well, how about uh, family tensions? Yeah, that was just, you know, several years later when Cain and Abel were old enough for one to kill the other. Um, and, and you, you go through the things that we encounter here and they are literally happening. There's that word literally, but they are literally and historically happening for the first time. And we don't have to trace back through all the things that might be affecting them. We, we can turn back two pages and see where they're coming from. Man's made in the image of God. Man rebelled against God. God intervened with this thing called grace, which is at work within history. That's pretty much it at this point. Mm -hmm. And as Rachel said, we're seeing the image of God played out. We're seeing man's impulse to dominion played out. We're seeing the corruption of sin. And we're seeing it in a very simplified form. And we're seeing a rush to judgment. Since the flood, it's been, what, about another 4,000 years. And we're not yet on the edge of oblivion, although a lot of people like to think we are. But shorter lifespans and the presence of the gospel in the world and other factors you can throw in uh, have slowed down this, this hasten, hastening toward Ragnarok. I won't say Armageddon. And, but, there's, but as we step into history and try to figure things out, there's always so much to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like Aunt B says on the Andy Griffith show. Hmm. 
These kids have so much history homework. I guess that's because there's more of it these days. <laughs> when I started teaching history, if I got to the 1940s or 50s, I felt great because I was born in 1958. <laughs> My parents in the 20s or so, I didn't consider anything after that really to be history. That was current events. That was go talk to your grandparents. <laughs> now, um, none of the kids in my class were born before the year 2000. Um, and that's going to keep going. Uh, eventually, 2000 will be a myth. Mm -hmm. like, you, you lived during the year 2000? <laughs> Y2K and everything. Yeah, Y2K. Oh, well, tell me about that. I've, yeah, oh, the legends that will abound. Um, <laughs> So, well, there's hope too in this. That we, yeah. We've seen the rush to judgment and we've seen what God does with it, which is recreation. So recreation. We can't have recreation if we don't have the account of the original creation and the disaster yeah. that followed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it, it is a cosmic story. The whole earth is wrapped up in this. It's not some little local event in some obscure corner of the world. Um, it, it, it's huge. And we, it, but it takes about, what is it, 656 years? And then after that, there's a couple hundred more years while humanity gets restarted. So, about the first 2,000 years of history, uh, secular history has forgotten. The ancients, by and large, didn't record or they turned it into mythology. Archaeology can't go back past the flood. Uh, Woolley's book, History Begins in Sumer, is evidence of this. He's dead. He has a long list of all the first that happened in Sumer well after the flood, because we just can't go back any further unless we believe the Bible. So this is, we're, we're taking up a huge amount of human history, uh, mm -hmm. the first, nearly the first 2,000 years with this, this podcast and the next one. Now only leaves 4,000. We're taking in, in two, it, this is great, in two podcasts, we're doing one third of Earth's history. Isn't that great? <laughs> fantastic. It's fantastic. We're so efficient. Yes. <laughs> yeah, then it'll start slowing down. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, the, the, the first 4,000 years, you know, are Bible times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happened in Bible times. Yeah, you mean the first 4,000 years of human history? Mm. That are all the same, of course, because we refer to them as a single <laughs> entity. <laughs> Everyone dressed alike, spoke alike, ate alike, traveled alike. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I will leave you, I will, I will leave us with this. Uh, maybe we can get to it next time. In the, the somewhere in the middle of the Hel Hellenistic age, no, at the at the tail end of the Hellenistic age, it actually was drifting into the uh, Byzantine Empire. The emperor in Byzantium in Constantinople had a throne room designed with uh, metallic animals and a metallic jungle and forest and garden, where the animals sprung to life, tweeted, hawked. Uh, bellowed whatever with the proper sounds, and he himself was let down as if levitated to make a divine appearance. And they could be snatched up when people were bowing as if he had vanished and then let down again. <laughs> and this was all done with air and water pressure. <laughs> and we have historical documentation of it. That's late in the curve. What might have been before that? We're not as smart as we think we are. Disney was not so great when he invented the tiki room. He just had more tools in his uh, wallet, as it were. <laughs> well, I think that that lays up the recommendation of a poem by W.B. Yeats, Sailing to Byzantium, mm. which is a fun little piece of paganism. But, uh, While we're doing yeah. recommendations from Yeats, how about the second coming? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Where we slouched to Bethlehem to bring forth some rugged beast thing. Yeats was um, a very talented poet. His worldview, mm -hmm. somewhere between dark magic, spirituality, and modern pessimism. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't read him to get a feel right. for how that age thought. They were uh, Yeats was mm -hmm. ready for the end of the world. Mm -hmm. He missed. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Rachel, you got some? Yes, mine is feels much more uh, spiritual <laughs> than all of those. <laughs> Rather um, than our favorite occultist poet. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to go very uh, straight line there to um, 
my husband, David, just finished a book that he really enjoyed and he had it recommended to him by his dad. So I'm going to recommend it, uh, which is called Delighting in the Trinity Mm. by Michael Reeves. And it goes through essentially the implications of the doctrine of the Trinity and how that should encourage us and strengthen our faith. So I know he particularly, yeah, he particularly enjoyed one section that reminded him of the immensity of God's love for us because Mm. he loves us. Even the father loves us, even as he loves Jesus and Jesus Mm. loves us, even as he loves the father and we are in the midst of it all. And uh, one day he came home and he was just overwhelmed with the love of God because of reading this book. So I'm going to recommend it to all. Excellent. Sounds great. (laughs) Well, thank you both for this conversation. It's been Mm -hmm. a pleasure. Uh, Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. And big thank you to our financial supporters as well. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always email us at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. One thing I've been forgetting to say lately is that this is a production of Diecast Media Group. Uh, that's that's new this season. Uh, the podcast predates the media group, but it's <laughs> it's all it's all coming together. If you are financially supporting this podcast, um, rest assured that those donations, those gifts, go to this podcast and not to anything else. Um, we we don't take a pay cut. It just it goes back into the show so that we can bring you more awesome content. So big thank you to our financial supporters. I think that's all I had to say. You can find us on YouTube, on Facebook, and Rumble, and any other podcast catcher you like. Tell a friend about us. Thanks. Good night. Bye.